Hi everyone, my name is Nikila Ravi and I'm a research engineer in the Facebook AI research team working on computer vision and 3D understanding. This talk will be about 3D deep learning with PyTorch 3D and in particular I'll focus on the functionality and performance. I'm presenting on behalf of the PyTorch 3D team. We're a small team of engineers and scientists spread across Facebook AI research in Menlo Park and London. In this talk, I'll cover four main areas. First, I'll give some context on the need for a 3D deep learning library. I'll then share some of the key goals of PyTorch 3D. I'll deep dive into some of the different components in the library and explain the functionality and some performance benchmarks. I'll spend a bit more time explaining rendering and differentiable rendering, and finally, share a few simple use cases. To motivate the need for a deep learning and 3D library, let's take a step back and think about what's needed to train a deep learning model, for example in 2D for image classification. The end-to-end -end pipeline requires taking inputs, which are batched, for example a batch of images, passing them through efficient operations, passing them through loss functions, and supporting gradients everywhere so you can backpropagate through the whole pipeline. Now optimized implementations of a lot of these components for 2D are already available. But now let's think about what's needed for deep learning with 3D data. For example, this is the mesh RCNN architecture. What are the differences between this and learning in the 2D space? First, we need to support batches of 3D data, for example, meshes. Second, we need to support operations which can work on 3D batched data in a fast and memory efficient way, as well as being differentiable to support gradients. Third, we need specific loss functions for predicted 3D data that also need to be fast, memory efficient and differentiable. It might be useful to also look more specifically at the differences between deep learning with 2D and 3D data. So one training example in the 2D case might be an image of size 1024 by 1024. In the 3D case, a single mesh can have tens of thousands of vertices and faces. Next, let's consider batching. So first, why batches? A standard practice in deep learning is to feed models with batched inputs at train time and accumulate gradients within that batch. This is done for many reasons, including that it leads to more robust training. For example, for images, batching is simple as it can be represented by a four-dimensional tensor of shape, a uh, number of elements by three by height by width. But meshes are more complex than images. A mesh is a collection of vertex coordinates and faces which index into the vertices. Meshes of different sizes can cause a number of challenges. What if you have a mesh with 29,000 vertices and another mesh with 24,000 vertices? How do you batch this? It's not clear what the best way to do this is. Lastly, I want to touch upon the idea of differentiability. In the 2D space, such as recognition systems like Mask RCNN, both the data and the 2D operations live on a 2D grid. A shape is just on or off squares on this 2D grid. Here, it, this is shown by black versus white squares. And this can represent something like a silhouette. Both the prediction and the ground truth data live on 2D grids, and we don't need any exceptional handling of data or operations in order to be able to propagate gradients. 3D voxels are similar to 2D masks in that they are confined to this regular grid. But 3D meshes or 3D point clouds are not confined to have XYZ coordinates to be on grid locations, and they are continuous representations. So to build operations that can propagate back to continuous 3D space, such as graphics operators like rendering, we need to reformulate these operations either in the forward or backward pass, or both, to support differentiability. 
we found that for 3DD planning tasks, there weren't any good tools which fulfill all the requirements I mentioned previously. If we could create something in this space, then we felt that we would be able to accelerate research at the intersection of deep learning and 3D. So we built PyTorch 3D, a library of optimized and reusable components for 3D deep learning research tasks. The goals of PyTorch 3D are to combine the features of a good deep learning library namely being fast, modular, differentiable, and compatible with PyTorch, which is one of the most popular deep learning tools, with the features needed for working with 3D data, so supporting different 3D data formats, like meshes and point clouds, heterogeneous batching of 3D data, and implementations of common 3D operators. A key focus throughout is efficiency, modularity, and differentiability. Next, I want to talk about the structure of the code base and deep dive into some of the key, key components. PyTorch 3D has multiple layers. The foundation layer consists of data structures for 3D data, data loading utilities, and composable transforms. The data structures in particular enable the operators and loss functions and the renderer in the second layer to efficiently support heterogeneous batching. So to start, let's look more closely at one of these foundational components, which are the data structures for 3D data. We found that batching meshes requires different batching strategies and the flexibility to be able to move from one representation to the other. This is because different operators might be more efficient with different views of the data. So we created meshes, a data structure for batches of heterogeneous meshes. Meshes takes as input the vertices and faces for a batch of meshes. With meshes, you can start by defining a batch of meshes as a list of tensors. For example, here there are a list of vertices for mesh 1 and mesh 2, and there'll be a corresponding list of the faces. We can then easily switch to a packed representation, which is just a different view on the same data. With this representation, we need some auxiliary information. For example, the first indices into the packed tensor for each batch element. The same view reshaping is also done to the faces tensor. The packed re representation is useful for operations like graph convolution, which don't care about any batch dimension. We might then need to reshape the vertices to add back in the batch dimension, and this involves padding the vertices based on the number of vertices of the largest mesh in the batch. This can take a lot of memory if there's large size variation, so having the flexibility to use either representation is useful. The padded representation is useful for other operators like vertex align. We can see why this flexibility is important by returning back to the mesh RCNN architecture diagram. The mesh's data structure is used throughout and the representation of the vertices and faces in the batch is interchanged multiple times during the end-to-end -end loop. For example, we start with a list representation in the cubify operator. The vertex align operator then takes the padded representation, and immediately after this, graph convolution is more efficient with the packed vertices and faces. Encapsulating the bookkeeping and logic inside a data structure makes this interchangeability really easy. Here's a quick code example of how you can use the mesh's data structure and easily switch between different views and also access other properties of the mesh. So we start by importing PyTorch and then importing meshes from PyTorch 3D. We then initialize the vertices and faces as lists of tensors. And then we can create a batch by passing these into the mesh's constructor. 
to obtain the pad packed representation, we simply call verts packed on this batch object. And then we can also access these auxiliary tensors by calling the appropriate methods. We can also access other mesh properties such as the edges, which are computed internally. Next, let's look at some of the optimized operators in PyTorch 3D. K nearest neighbors for d-dimensional points are used in chamfer loss, normal estimation, and many other point cloud operations. Here, we have two point clouds, P and Q. For a given point, in cloud P, the goal is to find the K closest points in cloud Q. So here we have K equals 5. We implement exact KNN with custom CUDA kernels that natively handle heterogeneous batches of points. Our implementation uses template metaprogramming to individually optimize each DK pair. We compare against FICE which is a fast GPU library for KNN. The PyTorch 3D implementation is tuned for small descriptor size and for K less than 32, while FICE is um, targeting a different portion of the design space and it doesn't handle batching, but it's optimized for high dimensional descriptors and it also scales to billions of points Whereas for 3D deep learning, we might only care about hundreds of thousands of points. First, let's look at the difference in performance for finding the closest neighbor, so when k equals 1, and varying numbers of points in each point cloud. In terms of speed, we're approximately five times faster than FICE. Memory-wise, the PyTorch 3D implementation has the same memory usage. For the next benchmark, we vary the number of nearest neighbors. In the case of low dimensional descriptors, so here D is equal to three, we see that PyTorch 3D implementation is faster. Overall, PyTorch 3D KNN provides a fast option for the batched 3D problems that we care about for 3D deep learning research. Another operator which is used frequently with meshes is graph convolution. Each vertex in the mesh can have an associated feature vector, fi. For example, in mesh RCNN, there is an image-aligned feature vector for each mesh vertex. Graph convolution computes new feature vectors for each vertex, propagating information along the edges of the mesh. So for one particular node, this involves two steps. First, we need to gather the features of all the adjacent nodes. And then we need to sum the features of these adjacent nodes and then add them back to the original node's feature vector. If we look at the code for this calculation, it's actually fairly simple and straightforward and only a few lines of code in PyTorch. We need to perform this gather scatter step, which finds the edges, adds the features and then adds them back to the original node. and so we can implement this gather scatter function in PyTorch. However, this step is actually very slow in PyTorch and a, and a fused CUDA kernel enables significant speed up in comparison. We benchmark the speed for heterogeneous batches of meshes sampled from ShapeNet. In terms of performance, we can see that the optimized CUDA implementation is up to 30% faster than the naive PyTorch implementation when it comes to both speed and memory usage. The next set of components which are required for many tasks are loss functions. Let's take the example of chamfer loss, which is a method of comparing two sets of point clouds. For example, these points might be sampled from the surface of a mesh. Chamfer loss is used as a loss function in many 3D deep learning research tasks. So for each point in point set one, which might be the prediction, we need to find the nearest neighbors in set two, which might be the ground truth and vice versa. 
This is a fairly simple calculation, which can be done with only a few lines of code in PyTorch. The bottleneck here is the nearest neighbor calculation. This can be an expensive computation, as we need to calculate this pairwise distance matrix and then find the minimum value. This can be very memory intensive. And this calculation is done in every iteration of the training loop, so it's important that it's, it's efficient in order to have a healthy training cycle. Even if we try a vectorized version, this still has the same memory issue, as we still have this pairwise distance matrix. And it also won't work for heterogeneous batches without additional processing. Here, we compare the time and memory usage for the naive vectorized implementation with the optimized CUDA kernel for heterogeneous batches of point clouds. We notice that the CUDA version reduces time and memory by more than 12x. And additionally, with the naive approach, we encounter out of memory errors for point clouds with points greater than 10,000. And so this limits the scale of the data that we can deal with. In the next section, I want to deep dive into rendering and, and in particular differentiable rendering and explain the design choices made for the PyTorch 3D implementation. Going back to the mesh RCNN diagram again, the input here is an image and the output is a mesh. But what about the reverse, going from mesh back to an image? Rendering is the process of generating a 2D image from a 3D model. It's been studied extensively in the graphics community, but the idea of adding gradients to make this step differentiable and using this for deep learning is relatively new and exciting. It enables us to bridge the gap between 3D and 2D and enables image-based 3D reasoning because we can relate 2D pixels back to 3D properties. Traditionally, the first step of rendering involves looking at the relative position in the xy direction of the triangle faces to see which pixel it intersects with, and then using a step called z-buffering to look at the distance from the image plane to each of the mesh faces and determining which is the closest. Both the steps I mentioned, determining if a pixel overlaps a face and then determining which face is closest in the z-direction, involve discretization steps which are non-differentiable. The second step is shading, where additional properties of a scene, such as the lights and texture, are taken into account to, to give a color to each pixel. When it comes to making this rendering process differentiable, we are definitely not the first people to think about this idea. There are several existing papers which address these problems in different ways. We particularly liked the soft rasterizer approach and took some of these ideas and added our own innovations on top. So what does having differentiable rendering step in a training loop mean? So let's start by literally setting the scene. So in a scene, we might have an object such as a mesh. This could have an associated texture map. There might be some light sources. There's also going to be a camera, which is the viewpoint from which the image of the scene is generated. Now, how do all these scene properties come into play in differentiable rendering? So each of these scene properties could be a variable which we want to learn. For example, the position of the camera, the intensity of the light, the position of the mesh vertices. The forward pass of a differentiable renderer might look, might look like something like this. First, we transform the input data using the camera properties. Then, we pass this through a renderer to generate an image. So remember, this includes rasterization and shading. The image might be used as part of a loss function. And finally, we want to be able to propagate gradients back through the whole system and update the scene properties. 
This is where the renderer needs to be differentiable so we can learn these scene properties in a loop. So why is rendering not differentiable? I'm going to now explain the two problems I mentioned earlier. So first, the Z buffering problem. For a given pixel, if there are two triangles which intersect with it that are overlapping in the Z direction, I mentioned that the color of the closest face in the Z direction is assigned to the pixel. So in this case, the pixel color would be yellow. If we were to then move the yellow triangle by a small amount in the Z direction, what would happen to the pixel color? Now the pixel overlaps with the red triangle instead of the yellow triangle. So we see that the pixel color undergoes a step change to go from yellow to red. So the step change is not differentiable. One solution is instead of returning the closest face to the pixel, is to return the top k closest faces and blend them. In Soft Rasterizer, they look at every single face for a particular pixel, but we suggest in PyTorch 3D that looking at the top k faces should be enough, where k is a user configurable parameter. This means that even occluded faces can contribute to the value of a pixel color, and more importantly, the gradient from one pixel can propagate back to far-reaching vertices and occluded faces. The second problem is determining whether a pixel is covered by a triangle based on the 2D relative distance between the pixel and the triangle. Now we're looking at the XY plane. We again see a similar problem to the Z buffering case when a face is moved in the XY direction. So for a given pixel here, the center of the pixel is inside the blue triangle. So the pixel color is blue, if this was the closest triangle in the Z direction. Now let's consider what happens when we shift the blue triangle by a small amount in the X direction. The pixel now doesn't overlap any faces. So the pixel color undergoes a step change to go from blue to having no color. And again, the step change is not differentiable. We can solve this by adding a small blur value in the xy direction around each face. In PyTorch 3D, we made several key decisions um, which differentiate our implementation from soft rasterizer. And I'll explain each point in turn by taking you step by step through the PyTorch 3D rendering engine. First, we separate the rasterizer and shader into separate modules instead of having one monolithic CUDA kernel which does everything. Inside the rasterizer, CUDA, inside the rasterizer we have multiple steps. First, the camera is used to project the mesh and transform it. Then, we have a two-step rasterization process. First, the image is split into a grid of coarse tiles, and faces are culled if they don't fall within these tiles. In the second step, we do a pixel-wise rasterization based on the reduced subset of faces. We also output four intermediate variables for each pixel, which we called the fragments. This includes the Z buffer value, the 2D Euclidean distance, the barycentric coordinates, and the face index per pixel. And in addition, as I mentioned previously, we return the top K values for each of these variables. In the shader, we continue to keep the top K values while applying shading and texturing. And finally, in the blending step, aggregate across the top K values. The rasterization is in CUDA for efficiency, but the rest of the pipeline is in PyTorch for increased modularity and ease of experimentation. For example, in the blending step where we aggregate across the top K values, this modularity is really useful because we can try different blending functions in PyTorch without having to know CUDA. The blending for this cube uses the softmax blending formulation from Soft Rasterizer, which can be written in a few lines of code in PyTorch instead of being hidden away in a CUDA kernel. 
For mesh texturing, we offer several options. First is simply having d-dimensional textures for each vertex, for example, a simple RGB color. This can be interpolated across the face to give the face a color. Vertex textures can be represented as a n by v by d tensor. This is a fairly simple implementation though, and it can't model complex textures if the mesh faces are large. Second, we can have vertex UV coordinates and a single texture map for the whole mesh. For a given point on the face, the face color can be computed by interpolating the UV coordinates and then sampling from the texture map. This representation requires two tensors, one for the UV coordinates and another one for the texture map, and it's limited to support only one texture map per mesh. In more complex cases, such as shape net meshes, there are multiple texture maps per mesh, and some faces don't have any texture, while others do. In this case, a more flexible representation is a texture atlas, where each face is represented by an R cross R texture map, where R is a texture resolution determined by the user. This is also inspired by the soft rasterizer implementation. For a given point on the face, the texture value can be sampled from the per face texture map using the barycentric coordinates of the point. This representation requires a single tensor and allows rendering of complex mesh textures. We did some benchmarks for forward and backward paths for textured mesh rendering in comparison with soft rasterizer with varying faces per mesh. We used heterogeneous batches of meshes sampled from ShapeNet and showed the mean time for the forward and backward paths compared to soft rasterizer. In terms of speed, we are more than four times faster because in PyTorch 3D, we natively support heterogeneous batching and also we cache the top K values from the forward pass, meaning that this doesn't need to be recomputed in the backward pass as is done in soft rasterizer. In terms of memory, the PyTorch 3D implementation has higher memory footprint, but this is due to the increased modularity because we output many more tensors such as the fra fragment data from rasterization. We feel that this modularity um, is, the, the high memory use is offset by this, the increased modularity. Overall, the PyTorch 3D implementation is significantly faster for large meshes, higher resolution images, and heterogeneous batches. Finally, I want to showcase a few examples of how you can use PyTorch 3D in real world applications. One is 3D shape prediction. Two is bundle adjustment. Third is pose optimization given a reference image. And lastly, textured rendering. We have tutorials for these four examples on the PyTorch 3D GitHub repository. So to conclude, PyTorch 3D is a fast, modular, and differentiable library for 3D deep learning with many common 3D operators, differentiable rendering, and heterogeneous batching support. We hope you use it for your projects. You can find the code on GitHub, and if you have any questions, feel free to find me on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in.